so uh, if folks can't hear me, I'm talking to a speakerphone, so please, you know, ping, say something, or, or ping me, or ping Mike, please. Um, but, um, but thank you all for, for joining in here, and I saw some familiar names in the, in the list of participants, so I'm um, hoping I'm not going to bore anybody of things I've already, already heard, but um, I'm going to try to pitch this sort of towards a, kind of a general audience um, and, and hope to bring some folks that don't normally think about maritime archaeology uh, kind of into the fold a little bit. So uh, what, I'm, what am I planning on covering today? Um, is I'll, I'll do a, just a brief introduction and definition of what maritime cultural landscapes are. I'll talk just briefly about how it, um, it, it kind of came to be. I'll give a, a short as I can example from my own work um, and then spend some time talking about what sort of I see the, the key advantages and points of, of doing a kind of maritime cultural landscape approach as well as some things that uh, coming from sort of a management perspective um, having to sort of manage these resources, things that I think are, are worth, worth thinking about. So that's that's what, that's my game plan for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, in terms of defining maritime cultural landscapes, and, and I'll just refer to them as MCLs uh, for, for brevity, uh, much of it comes back to Christopher Westerdahl um, and one of his more recent definitions of, of what a maritime cultural landscape is, is the, the whole network of sailing routes with ports, havens, and harbors along the coast, and its related constructions and other remains of human activity underwater as well as terrestrial. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really good definition. I might expand it slightly to talk about basically um, all of the evidence of how people interacted with, with watery places, um, both on land and, and underwater. Um, and this can in, include a, a wide range of um, of locations uh, and types of resources that are all tied together with how a, a particular group or groups interacted with the water. Uh, and, and since it tends to be linked to um, a specific culture or set of cultures, it will often be spatially bounded. Um, so it's, it's bounded by where those peoples lived and used the water, and so it does tend to have a spatial boundary on it. Um, and, but the, the number of resources, the types of resources, could be could be pretty broad. It could be things you know ranging from resource procurement, so wild rice and fishing grounds, to everything that includes like um, whaling lookout stations on shore. Um, can include navigation, so lighthouses. Um, as Westerdahl talks about ports and landing places, but also uh, shore roads. Um, and, and coastal religious centers, so there's a lot of monasteries, for example, right on the coasts. Um, but it also might include somewhat harder to quantify a phenomenon such as the fish themselves that the people are fishing for, um, and things like waves and tides, um, uh, or you know, bioluminescence, uh, you know, any number of, of things along those lines. Um, and because of the, that wide variety of, of types of, of resources or types of properties that might in my intersect, um, the methods also tend to be pretty broad, um, you know, including terrestrial and maritime archaeological survey, but also ethnography, uh, place name analysis, so, uh, toponymy, uh, historical research, and then other things that sometimes are a little on the, the softer side or the more humanity side, um, such as art, um, literature, investigations of religion, um, as well as those that tend towards sort of the more scientific side of archaeology, um, paleoclimate, and paleoenvironmental reconstructions, and those kind of similar um, activities. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a broad um, spectrum of methods as well. The other thing I would try to always start with is that, at least in my, from my perspective, um, MCL is not a theory. Um, MCL is an approach. Um, it's, a, it's a way to 
mainly in Europe, uh, kind of spreading, spreading from there. Um, and um, that is not by coincidence, honestly. Um, it's, it is, I think, linked to um, changes in um, some of the UN um, legislation and other national legislation that, that begins to sort of put, um, well, does two things. One, that, that, that sort of starts a stress survey over excavation um, and knowing where sites are rather than, than excavating them. Um, and also a, a sort of expanding definition of what maritime is um, and moving away from just shipwrecks. And so um, I, I think the sort of the, the rise of interest in maritime cultural landscapes is not simply because it's a good idea. I think because it, it was an idea that then fit um, some, some other needs and desires that are coming um, from, um, from heritage managers. Um, and then in the U.S., um, we're a little bit behind what's going on in Europe and the rest of the world, but by the late 2000s, um, federal agencies and, and state and tribal um, uh, heritage managers start to kind of cue into this, and, and you see an increasing use of it, um, like the National Register-sponsored symposium that, that Mike mentioned earlier. Um, in, in all of this, I kind of like to drive home that it, it does have a lot of roots in in heritage management. Um, Lester Dahl himself basically kind of created the idea out of having done big sort of coastal surveys and was trying to find a way to integrate this, this data that he was getting both on land and on water. And so um, that's that's where much of the roots of it come from. And, and just as a personal aside, that's why I got into it. Um, I had a background in, in CRM going into to working on a PhD and looking for a tradition topic and the methods behind um, MCL really appealed to me. So the fact that I could ask theoretical questions with methods I already knew um, is what kind of drew me into it as well. So it's got, it, it, there's some linkages there that I think are useful for a wide variety of archaeologists. Um, anybody have any questions at this point? I mean, this is a good place to pause for a second. Um, Yeah, Ben, uh, in, the, in the post Hans, in the material that went out, it, it referred to uh, some attached uh, readings for references for kind of additional readings, but kind of got dropped from the email chain. It's just a just a you know technical question. Yeah, um, uh, Mike has them. I can send them to you, um, but we can definitely get those out to you. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, I'll resend those. Sorry, it got dropped. All right. Um, um, any other questions they might can do for it now? Well, I'd like to thank you for mentioning the natural resources as potential elements of cultural significance. I mean, in Hawaii, we, we, we can't mention maritime cultural landscape without, uh, you know, going beyond just, uh, you know, navigational routes and, and things that, that were covered very well by Westerdahl. Yeah, for sure. I think, and I'm going to come back to that because I, I see it as a way that we can actually intersect with, um, you know, Big, quite big, big environmental concerns like changing sea levels and those kinds of things as well. So yeah, I think it's a you can't take the environment out of the landscape. Exactly. Well, um, I'll just sort of soldier on here a little bit, um, and I'll give an example from my own work, and it's it's not the best example, it's just the example that I know the best essentially. Um, and, and what I want to do briefly is, is just talk a little bit about. Um, uh, kind of what we did up on Lake Ontario, um, what we found, and how we interpreted it. Um, I saw Brad Kruger um, in the participant. So, Brad, some of this will look familiar to you. Um, basically, what we did uh, seven surveys that were half on land and, and half on, on water, um, kind of spanning the, the, the boundary there, um, or the sea boundary. And, um, you know, up front, it was, it was informant interviews, because uh, so the ethnography is a big, big part of this, um, and talking to folks about what what they knew about, um, what they were aware, of, their sort of personal histories of, of these people. Um, wherever we got permission um, from landowners, because land is all, it's all private property, we we did field walking and you know basically your standard terrestrial surveys. Um, supplemented in a few places with a little bit of excavation, but primarily looking for surface exposures um, underwater. If, a um, standard um, marine remote sensing survey. Um, in, in this particular instance, I don't actually have a three-deck yacht. I had a, um, 
small thingy. Um, and we only used um, side scan and, and magnetometry. And if, if folks want more information about those technologies, we can talk about that later. But um, it's the way to see under the water and to a certain extent under the sediment um, from the surface. And, and ran a, a relatively tight um, survey grid, about 15 meters, um, up as, as shallow as we could get, up to about three meters or 10 feet of water. Um, and then in, in the shallows, did um, diver surveys, um, again, to swimming transects, um, as well as, um, and then trying to overlap those with a, um, with the, 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 the remote sensing survey so that we had complete coverage. We also worked the mag pretty close into, into, into land there um, because it, it, it would work in shallow water with some floats on it. Um, we also did some supplemental work in terms of coring um, and, and actually in some places using uh, ground penetrating radar and magnetometry through the, the, the frozen surface to get better results in some places. Um, but, but all in all, um, not particularly earth-shattering methods, sort of using existing methods to try and look at this both sides of the, of the water line. Um, and again, so I'm going to talk about these two places uh, up on Wolf Island as, as well as Carlton Island. Um, you can see that we surveyed a bunch of other um, locations, but a truism is that humans don't use the environment um, evenly, and the environment does not preserve human uses evenly. So some of these places were utilized less than others historically it seems. Other ones um, had bedrock um, bottoms and they were scraped clean every every year by the ice. Um, and so it, it, uh, I'll focus on the ones where I can I can say a little bit more um, meaningful. Um, the first one, and, and some of you have seen this example before because I, I really love it because I think it's one of the best examples of a cultural landscape, uh, maritime or otherwise, that, that I've ever run across. Um, because it, it shows you know, different groups using the same space um, iteratively and, and differently. Um, it touches on um, trends that run throughout the Great Lakes, including um, you know, Native American occupations, French, British, American, Canadian, uh, military use, agricultural use, lumber production, um, connections across the border, tourism, economic collapse, because that's big up there, um, and then uh, the, the modern preservation ethic. All of these things sort of all together in this, this one little little space, um, back and forth across the, the water line. Uh, before the Europeans showed up, uh, the Native Americans were definitely using Carlton Island um, as a transit location and for some burials. Um, and, and what I find interesting here is that throughout the Great Lakes, um, we see cultures laying their landscape on top of each other. So um, you see Native peoples you know, using certain places for portage locations, um, and then the French come and put missions and trading posts there, and then the, the British come and begin to develop some of those as ports because many of them are river mouths. Um, and, and by the time the Canadians and the Americans are on the scene, um, these become the major cities. And so the, the uses of previous groups of the landscape influence how later groups use the landscape. And, and we see that um, at Carlton Island. Um, it becomes much more historically evident um, or visible in, this, in 1778 when the, the British make it their, uh, make it a provincial naval base. And it's a transshipment point for goods coming down the, or up the St. Lawrence and then across the Great Lakes. Um, they have a shipyard there, um, and they, they basically use Carlton Island, Fort Niagara, um, and Oswego, plus the ships that run between them to control the Great Lakes and control Lake Ontario. And there's, there's a reason why during the American Revolution um, we don't talk about the Great Lakes very much, and it's because the, 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 the rebels never really got a foothold there because of the British control coming out of, out of largely out of Carlton Island. Um, and, and much of that is still preserved here. Um, the fort itself is still visible on the landscape um, with some, some surface archaeological features, um, and it is very much a landscape feature. It, it sits on a high um, bluff, sort of looking over um, the main um, military harbor. It's called Shank Harbor on the map there, it's called North Harbor, North Bay today. Um, and, it's a, and so it's the, using the land as a way to, to control um, and protect this space. Um, within Shank Harbor, there's still evidence of the major sort of British use. There's a, a pretty massive, now submerged dock that was um, part of their naval infrastructure. Um, and also within the, the harbor is a shipwreck. Uh, it's not a wreck that occurred during the war, but it, it appears to be the wreck of the Haldeman, which was a, a British naval vessel 
during the American Revolution that looks like it was scuttled um, after the war here. And so it, it's a little bit post hoc, but it does provide a, a pretty um, a strong connection to the place because this is a, a vessel that would have run back and forth from, from here to Niagara carrying soldiers and goods um, and, and officers back and forth to really form that, this, this sort of connection across the lake. Um, so, you know, all of these things are, are there on the landscape to help us interpret how the British use the space. I'll also note that Shank Harbor is, um, the bottom is littered with artifacts um, from when they decommissioned the, the, the fort and the, the island, um, and it's a place that is pretty heavily um, pillaged by, by divers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them coming out of Canada, because Canada has much stronger walls about these things, and so they often see America as sort of a little bit of a, of a place where they can go and collect things with less repercussions, which is um, an unfortunate part about being on the border there. Uh, after the um, after the war, um, it's a lot of squatters living there. Um, one of the sites from these sort of um, itinerant or people who don't own the land but are living on it um, is this Voorhees site where there's a, uh, it was collected somewhat unsystematically by a, by a local guy. Um, but in amongst his collection, there's all kinds of interesting things that help us sort of see what the site was, but for me at least, there's a, a, a substantial number of um, British military buttons. So this is a, a person who either was in the military or took advantage of um, sort of a glut of, of clothes that were available after after the war, um, but seems to have had some connections to Britain. Um, but then there's a bunch of coins as well, and amongst the coins are, uh, are British coins, um, Canadian coins, U.S. coins, as well as these... Um, Brock tokens um, that basically talk about, that commemorate Isaac Brock's death at Queenstown during the War of 1812, um, but also um, uh, talk about sort of commerce and, and trade. And, and so what we've got here is a, a person who at least is sympathetic to Britain, um, but is living on an American island uh, and participating in an economy that spans the border. So it's sort of a transnational, transborder economy with all these coins that he's using. Um, and so uh, we start to see these, these inklings of people moving back and forth across the, the water line and across the border using, using the water. Um, this is followed by a period where they develop a lot of farms on the island, and there's archaeological evidence uh, of this. Again, using the landscape, this is a, a dairy farm um, that was on the island based on the, the foundations, and they're, they're grazing the animals up on the upland, which has got really good fields, um, but keeping the, the doing the dairying down on this sort of this little low land neck near the water where it's cooler and they have access to the cold lake water. So again, using the landscape um, and sort of modifying it um, group after group. Um, with all those farms showing up, there's also a need to connect this island to the mainland. And so there was a, a ferry that ran from um, the New York side to Carleton and then on to, um, to Canada, um, both at Wolf Island and Kingston, um, connecting these places. So the, the transportation is sort of continuous uh, across the um, uh, across the border. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that briefly with the next example. Um, and then by the by the, the end of the 19th century, Carlton Island becomes actually one of the first islands in the Thousand Island region to be developed by by industrialists. William Wyckoff from Remington Typewriters um, builds this massive house up there um, in, in 1894, and, and he's really one of the first sort of industrialists to try to escape the um, smoke and, and whatnot that they've created um, with the Industrial Revolution and go up to this what looks like a fairly untouched place um, and have his, his, his retreat. Uh, this doesn't last super long. Um, there's some unfortunateness in the, in the Wyckoff family, um, and eventually GE requ acquires the property right before the Great Depression, which basically ends um, GE's plan that included a, um, a massive resort on the island for their employees that actually had a golf course that cut across the Revolutionary War fort. Um, and the, the, the detritus of this is also evident, um, both on land and underwater. So there's, you know, the, the villa itself is now derelict. The docks where they would have had their, their the expensive yachts parked are also derelict, and then uh, littering the, the underwater portion of 
just kind of adjacent. Um, I don't know if you can show here, but there's Carlton Island and there's there's what we looked on Wolf Island, and um, and, and Wolf Island, we, we in both these places we find all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to try to list all the different types of sites we found, but one of the most striking things with Wolf Island was the presence of a canal that basically was designed to cut across in the 19th century across the island. And this relates back to what I was saying before with the, the idea of these ferries that connected across. Um, for people in the 19th century on, on Lake Ontario, um, Wolf Island was a barrier, really, because um, they were moving by water almost exclusively. Um, and so Wolf Island becomes this sort of roadblock because to cut around the west side of it um, puts you exposed to basically the full fetch of Lake Ontario. So you, the, this gets slammed by storms and, and on a good day just heavy winds and waves. And then it's got this long tail that goes around behind it, so there's a, um, it's, it's inconvenient to go around. And so the, the notion at the time was to, to put a canal through it. Um, and, and again, sort of, and this, this canal functions during a period where Canada and the U.S. are not necessarily friends. Um, throughout the 19th century, there um, are a series of, of um, uh, scuffles and, and um, kind of back and forth where we're, we're not necessarily on, on good footing, starting with the embargo in 1812 and sort of running up through at least um, the Civil War, the American Civil War. Um, but despite that, trade continues on in this, this region. So... Um, Again, there's a, there's a lot of um, evidence of sort of a, of a pan lake or cross border identity because of uh, because of the water. Um, and, and one of the reasons that the Wolf Island Canal doesn't do well is that it, it, it gets beat out by trains um, and and the, the development of trains. Um, and initially, the Wolf Island Canal is conceived to connect. Canadian and U.S. rails, but by the time they get around to building it, the Canadian rail system has developed such that it's not a really a viable shipping route. Um, and I think this is a good reason landscapes, you know, you never want to just, sort of like when you take a test pit, you never want to just think about your test pit, you want to think about the site as a whole. Um, with landscapes, no matter how big your landscape is, you always kind of need to look up and look around because much of what defines a landscape and makes influences how people interacted with that landscape might be outside influences. We see that with the Wolf Island Canal. Um, along some of the same lines, we also see that with what, you know, tongue-in-cheek, I refer to as the Wolf Island um, coalscape, um, because there is a lot of evidence of the importation of coal to Wolf Island, because it, it, it's necessary to power what industry there was there as well as, as people's homes. And so um, there's, there's a series of docks that are now derelict, um, that, that were for the importation of coal, and they all collapsed basically um, in the early 20th century. And there's actually a shipwreck um, parked at one of these these, these docks, um, which is the, the remains of a steam barge that was the, the Scotia, was what it was named. Um, and it was it was built in 1871. Um, it had a full career, about 24 years, which is a good run for a Great Lakes um, vessel. Um, and then was actually, in 1895, condemned drug from Kingston over to Wolf Island and made into a dock. And so it was intentionally sunk, it was filled with coal, and the idea was that basically it would provide storage and easy access for the loading and unloading of coal. Uh, in 1905, the, the side of it fell off um, and it dumped about 500 tons of coal into the St. Lawrence River, which was um, uh, not stellar for its owner. Um, but um, This is, this is what it looks like now in terms of um, a side scan center image and then a plan view. And you can see the side laying 
on Lake Ontario, uh, slightly okay. more substantive thing is, is um, ice roads. Um, and, and ice roads come up a huge amount in the historical record. And people talk about using them, and they, they were incredibly important in terms of democratizing um, transportation. Um, because during the, the shipping months, you had to be able to get your, your, your commerce onto somebody else's ship. Um, in the wintertime, you could haul your, your goods in your own wagon. Um, and it also made the place smaller because instead of having to walk around an embayment, now you could walk across the embayment. So islands became um, even more connected and neighbors became, your neighbors sort of changed with these ice roads. But we spent three years doing archeology span up there and we never found an ice road, obviously, and um, they, they melt. Um, and um, we, we never really found even where they hit the ground in, in many places where they touch shore. The closest we ever got was occasionally you would find a vehicle underwater and that's probably a vehicle that went through the ice um, and that was about as close as we could get it. But d despite that, we, we know they were important um, and, and in fact they actually you know, were sort of a, um, how to put this, the, the, the laying out of them. And you can see in this, this slide there's a sort of Christmas tree off to the side and that's not uncommon to take um, evergreen boughs and, and either, either make a pile of slush and stick them in or melt a hole in the ice and, and mount them. Um, to mark these roads because the, the ice is not uniform. Um, in places where there's more current, um, the ice can be dangerously thin. And, and judging the ice um, was a, a skill that, that took years and years to develop. And so the, the people who laid these out um, represented a lot of traditional knowledge. And so you know, we wanted to try to capture that. And but it, it had to be captured through ethnography and through the historical record rather than strictly through archaeology. Um, the other thing that we we, we sort of um, had to deal with uh, quite a bit was um, changes in the lake level. Um, and, and like the oceans, the, the Great Lakes have changed over time. There's about a 60 meter swing um, in Lake Ontario um, as the, the glaciers melt. And it doesn't quite map to glacier melting. It has to do with um, where the water is flowing and, and various sills, but, but the, the, the lakes go up and down. Um, and, and that probably had a, a profound effect some Native American groups. Uh, for example, during the, during the Middle Arla Archaic period, um, the water was, was really low uh, and began to come up uh, rapidly because um, a, a sill gave way and, and, the, and the lake began to basically fill as, as much as, as quickly as it could hold water. Um, and that would have probably affected not only, you know, seeing the water coming up is one thing, but also there would have been a lot of sediment in that water, so it would have likely changed uh, the habitat for the fish and shellfish they were used to, to getting, as well as any um, uh, green plants. Um, and this is sort of a double whammy because it looks like from, from um, paleo, paleo climate record, um, there was a blight that was killing the hemlocks and the uplands, which would have affected the deer population. So this would have been a rough time to be living in this area. Um, and, and that, that very well could have had psychological and definitely physiological effects for the inhabitants of the region. We don't really know what they are um, at this point, but um, again, some kind of, by looking at sort of both the land and the water, we can get at, we can try to get at some of these things. Um, the, other, the other sort of thing that became apparent was that different groups saw the lake um, very, very differently. And um, I'm going to grossly oversimplify here, but um, what became apparent from looking at sort of the, the archaeological record in general was that um, there's a, there was a belief among, um, primarily among Algonquin speakers, but also Iroquois speakers, um, Iroquois speakers, um, that of, a, of a, either a horned serpent or a horned panther that lived in the water, um, and it was responsible for, for sinking of ships and for stirring up the water. Um, and, and this, this I'll refer to it as he, because when he's personified, it's almost always as a he. But when, when he shows up, um, shows up, he's, he's a, the enemy of, of thunderers. And so there's a, there's a disassociation between the waves and dangers in the lake, like um, uh, logs and those kinds of things, um, or just falling through the ice, frankly, um, and, and storms. Um, and on the other hand, you know, the Europeans, when they talk about the lake, they're mostly concerned about storms. Um, and they, 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 they see the lake itself as relatively benign unless there's a storm. And they, they, they frankly are really concerned about storms because there's a, a number of um, the Great Lakes, the, 
way storms form and the rapidity with which they form and the, um, the wavelength of waves make them fairly dangerous, as well as the fact that, um, that, that you, you can't run ahead of the storm on Great Lakes because eventually you're going to run out of lake. Um, whereas on the ocean, you can just, if you can stay ahead of the storm, you can, you can kind of run ahead of it. Um, and so we, we've got these, these two very different views of, of, of the lake. Um, some of this might go back to that lake level change. There's no real, at this point, no good way to make that connection. Um, some of it may be attached to technology uh, in that, um, that the, the primary sort of mode of transportation for, for big contact Native Americans were, up in this region, were, were birch bark canoes, which um, are actually pretty impressive structures. They can be 30 plus feet long. They can carry more than 900 kilo, kilograms of as a, a ton, um, and and they're you know relatively stable, but are susceptible to being swamped um, by waves. Are susceptible to be having a hole punch into them by a submerged um, uh, log, but really aren't don't like to worry about storms that much because they, you tend to work them close to shore. So if a storm comes up, you can run ashore, um, and, and so. Being hurt by thunderers is your own stupidity. Being hurt by the horned serpent is more of a surprise, more of a shock. Um, and whereas for the for the Europeans, again, the storms are what sinks their ship, and storms would drive them onto bars and onto the the um, shoreline, which is their main concern. Um, and I think one of the strongest arguments for this is that the, the, the traditional home of, of um, the horned serpent or horned um, our great panther um, is our, our rock faces, where a sheer rock face comes into the water, um, and that's the only place you can't pull a canoe out, really. And, and so, um, again, I don't, I don't want to oversimplify this because both of these groups are working in you know, long historical trajectories of interacting with the water um, that affect their economy as, as well as their religion and their, and their technology. So, uh, you know, to, to, to simplify it, to just basically canoes versus. Um, rigged ships uh, is, I think, uh, injustice, but it is something that sort of comes out of looking at um, that, that whole area. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop kind of boring you with, with stuff that, you know, the sort of minutia of, of Lake Ontario, and I just want to talk for a few moments here then about um, kind of coming out of this and, and, and thinking about maritime landscape, what I see as sort of um, important, important points, I guess. Uh, one is MCL is jargon. Maritime cultural landscape is jargon, um, and, and, and there's a lot of jargon in archaeology. I, I would say use it if it's useful to you. Um, if if you know if, if it gives you some, some traction, that's something that's helpful, helps you communicate with others. Great. Um, if you find using things like district or traditional cultural property, any of that uh, other lingo is more useful, then use that. Um, I think just the term landscape actually is, is a pretty handy term, as you guys are probably seeing with a lot of these um, these webinars, uh, that you know, landscape, landscape may allow you to communicate across agencies and across different specialties, um, and so whatever jargon works for you is fine. I, I, I don't like the MCL thing because sometimes people kind of get fixated on it a little bit. Um, in addition to that, um, I always kind of want to point out again that the, the multiple contributing elements or property types or like lines of evidence here. Um, I mean, you're going to have archaeological sites likely both above and below the water, but as you can see, you know, there's, there's, there's the built environment as well, so structures and buildings. Um, some of these may be grouped into, into districts, and then you, I, I, in many cases, because the water is so important to people, um, traditional cultural properties of some sort, I think, are also worth um, Worth considering, and 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 with each of those brings their own line of evidence. I mean, there's there's different ways to access and deal with underwater and terrestrial archaeological sites with built environment. Um, you know, there's different ways to access TCPs. I, I do think in all of these consultation is really really important because we're talking about using sort of current paradigms to try to preserve things for future peoples. And so I think it's always useful. You guys all know this. To, to talk to current peoples about what they, they think is important. Um, I, I would add, though, that one of the things that makes it helpful about a landscape approach in general is that um, you know 
Western knowledge tends to be fairly temporally derived a lot of times, um, whereas traditional knowledge for, for many cultures is more spatially derived. And so a maritime cultural landscape approach, or any landscape approach, frankly, um, I think is, is, is one way to, to access different ways of knowing and, and put everyone on a somewhat more of an even playing field. Um, with all these different uh, types of elements, contributing elements, um, it, I at least, uh, those of you who know me know I'm not that bright, so that it's just me, but um, the, I find it a little daunting sometimes to try to deal with all these things, and, and so what I've settled upon is what I, there's sort of an analogy of sites. Um, archaeologists are, are good at, we're trained at, um, interpreting spatial arrangements and, and, and looking for context to understand how features and artifacts and ecofacts all um, interact and, and, and look at their context and association to understand past activities. And, and when I look at a landscape, I just use that same logic, I just scale it up. Um, so that, you know, individual sites sort of think about them like features and, um, you know, isolated finds become sort of like artifacts and, and that this, this sort of spatial logic of and interpreting them um, is, I find to be sort of useful in terms of thinking about it. Um, the only other thing to remember then is that you sort of, when you scale up like that, you've also scaled up culturally as well. So you move from sort of maybe a household level interpretation to um, maybe a multi-group or intergroup um, level of interpretation. But for me, I found this a way to sort of break through my initial reticence with these sort of larger, larger spaces. Um, change tax slightly, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, I also like this because I'm, I'm trained to record ships, but um, ships have never been my favorite thing. Um, and so I, maritime cultural landscapes help us expand maritime archaeology beyond just shipwrecks, or beyond just shipwrecks and ports. Um, and, and shipwrecks are really, really important. So they are among the most data-rich um, and, and really evocative sites out there in all of archaeology, but they basically form a point um, and they're, they're, they're a single dot on a map or a single dot in, in time. Um, and, and what maritime cultural landscapes let us do is can begin to connect those dots, right? Connect the dots along the trade route, connect the dot to land, link the dot to the land, to the, to the, the hinterland, to understand what was being moved and why it was being moved. Um, because the, the, the reason for ships are the lines between the dots. Um, that's what they were built for, um, is to run from, from place to place and to move things from place to place. And, and same for sailors. Um, there are very few sailors who the, the, the point of seafaring was not to return to land, right? I mean, uh, most sailors want to get paid and come back to land just to spend that, that pay. Um, and so shipwrecks sometimes distract us from that. Um, and frankly, a maritime cultural landscape approach allows us to invert that traditional narrative about underwater archaeology um, from the ships and the disaster and look at, you know, why ships and shipping and maritime culture in general mattered to the people in that time or place. And so uh, I find it pretty powerful as a way to, to put ships in, in a context. Um, it, it also, I think, makes it somewhat more... Um, more inclusive, and I'll come back to this real briefly in a sec here, but you know, not everyone built ships that leave shipwrecks. Not every culture's ships are preserved, but, um, but maritime landscapes, most cultures left something that we can find in those landscapes. Again, it's a way to make underwater and maritime archaeology more, more inclusive. Um, additionally, I was going to point out that the boundary is not fixed. Uh, you guys are going to hear from I think, Torben Rick um, next time, we're going to talk about sort of paleo, um, submerged paleo sites. Um, and, and this is a way to bring those into the sites that we, we, the, we have on land, right? Because the, the continental shelf, the shoreline has moved up and down the continental shelf um, throughout time. And so just because the site is underwater or on land doesn't mean that's where it was intended to be. And so um, by thinking about from a landscape perspective and thinking sort of more spatially, I think it allows us to incorporate um, things that cut across not only the, the water line, but also across these sort of other made up line we have, which is the sort of pre-contact contact line. Um, and so it's a good way to break down some of those, those boundaries, and both, both, both our literal about boundaries and sort of our, our, our figurative boundaries. Um, the, the inclusivity thing I think is, 
also really, really important. Um, you know, you can bring together multiple periods and, and multiple cultures um, together with a landscape approach because people share that landscape. Um, you know, what I've been calling a landscape is just a place. Um, and places are important to multiple groups um, for, for, for various different reasons. And, and so one thing I think we can do here is begin to, um, uh, to, to integrate them um, in, in this approach because you know, cultures will come and go. That's one thing that I tried to highlight with the Lake Ontario example, but the place remains, right? Um, the place is always there. Um, and for most people, the, the place remain, remains important, right? So the groups may not agree about why the place is important, but they can agree that the place is I think it's a way to, to increase our inclusivity. I also think it's a way to increase inclusivity for underwater archaeology um, by bringing in land people, right? Um, you know, not everybody's a boater, not everybody's a kayaker or a diver, um, but, but many people who just like to wade into the water um, also have an interest in, in the sea and in, in maritime and lake environments. And so um, by, by taking a maritime commercial landscape approach, you can begin to tie those things that are off there, offshore, that are hard to see to the things that are onshore, um, and again, sort of put them on a little bit more even even footing, um, and kind of meet people where they're at with their interests, um, and, and and talk about how they're all interrelated and why they're all why they're all important. Um, and, and I think one of the things that, that increasingly everyone can agree on is that the environment um, is important. Um, there's there seems to be increasing concern among the American population about our seas and our oceans, um, both in terms of you know things like ocean acidification and, and changing habitats and warming that's affecting plants and animals, um, which also have an effect on archaeological sites. Um, so we're concerned about the, you know saving our oceans and, and the damage to them. Um, we're also concerned about the fact that they're that they're. they're, they're they're becoming more dangerous, right? They're getting, they're, they're increasingly coming into our domain, um, either through rising sea levels or through storms and those kinds of things. And so, um, it's a, I think this is a way to tie, tie that in, um, and, and kind of bring how how past groups dealt with these changes into the picture, um, and, and look at the. I'm running long here. I apologize. This is my my last major slide. Um, one, defining boundaries is a little bit hard uh, because people move around, um, and and um, because some of the things that we might want to include and, and be concerned about, like you know, fish species um, that were being hunted in some areas but then migrated through, um, are going to transcend those boundaries. So I think that's a, something to be worried about. Um, and I heard Tom King's talk on the last one of these, and, and his his point about you know. Maybe we don't have to draw a hard boundary. If we can agree that this area is important, um, maybe that, that's good enough. Um, issues of integrity, I think, are also going to be problems just because of the multiple um, uh, property types, um, and that you know they, they all sort of they've got slightly different practical reasons or how we interpret integrity for them. But I think that's something to consider. Um, and the last thing is that. Uh, Historic England has this notion of characterization, um, which is a way to look at landscapes and allow the landscape to still change and move and, and adapt while still protecting what makes it significant and culturally important. Um, and I can talk more about that, but there's also some, some really good readings from people who actually do this kind of stuff. And I think that's a real powerful way to begin to think about maritime cultural landscapes. Um, so with that, I will... I'll end my, my spiel. Great, folks out there, if you have any questions, um, feel free to jump in um, either through the, the microphone or through the chat. I'll be monitoring it. Um, I had one question, Ben, from earlier about um, submerged sites and how they fit into uh, uh, MCLs, how they're considered as MCLs. Uh, submerged ter terrestrial sites. Right. Um, so I mean, I I sort of conceive them at least as sort of with the the moving the moving waterline, um, in that you know a lot of, a lot of sort of coastal peoples tended to live at least some of their life or have some of their family on shore and then use the water for transportation, for trade, for resource procurement, um, whatever. Um, and so as that that waterline has moved, um, so have the habitations. 
so um, you know, I think one way of thinking about the maritime cultural landscape, especially in sort of a diachronic sort of through time perspective, um, is that it, uh, the shoreline is not fixed. And so, you know, we want to think about those sites that are submerged, but also think about sort of um, upland paleo um, shorelines. So on the Great Lakes, the, the lakes were also higher at some point. So there are, there are um, reported like boat building sites that are now 10 miles from the, from the shore. Um, and, and so I, I would include those all within sort of a diachronic landscape um, that, that would have looked different at different times. Great, great. And uh, um, Barbara Wyatt asked if you could share that last slide with some of your interesting looking sources. Sure, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and again, for some of you, um, you might have gotten a forward of um, my announcement. Um, so you may not have gotten the, the bibliography, the excellent bibliography that Ben had sent us. Um, I will resend it. And um, if you can find my email address, I'm at michael underscore roller at nps.gov. I can also resend it to you. Um, I did some reading myself for the last couple of weeks, and there's a lot of good stuff. There. Now, um, with these with these sources here, I'll um, I'll, re- I'll reveal the depth of my scholarship. If you Google characterization historic England, um, they're the top couple hits. Um, so these are um, so this is not. I mean, just just googling characterization in historic England um, will all <laughs> up um, pretty rapidly, and a bunch of other really interesting and useful stuff. Hey Ben, this is Hans. Great job, fantastic talk. I've got a question for you. Uh, obviously, you know, perspective on landscapes and place, very critical. Uh, my question is about viewsheds. Are viewsheds, in your ideas, seen as, you know, as the same, kind of the same as other elements of the landscape, or are they quantitatively different from other elements of the landscape, although obviously very important, or are they properties? Huh. Um. That's interesting. I, I never found them as, as properties. Um, I, I would have included them as, you know, in thinking about the boundary concern, um, sort of how I would have thought about them, because if, if the viewshed is an important part of it, so, you know, for example, the rising of the, or setting of the sun over a particular body of water um, is, is part of how you conceive of why that body of water is important. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have thought about it as a property necessarily, but I would have included it within um, consideration of that of that landscape. Um, and I, kind of play off that a little bit, you know, we often think of viewsheds as I sort of just described them, like you're standing on land looking at the water. Um, but for, for for many maritime peoples, the flip side is really important, right? Looking from the water to the land, um, and, and a lot of sort of people's uses of interactions with um, coasts are, are informed by you know how they, how it was coming from the water um, in terms of either access or what you could see and um, and so I think in thinking about view sheds I would think about it from from both both directions am I answering your question Hans I'm sorry yeah yeah I mean uh, you know property is kind of a management loaded uh, term obviously but the uh, but you know, I'm still working on you know considering the, the qualitative differences between you know elements of a landscape and viewsheds of elements of landscapes. But obviously, they're very important, and the, the the two ways the emphasis from sea back to shore is perfect for navigators. Yeah, and I think the other thing with viewshed is so one so landscape is sort of like one of these terms, sort of like culture, um, the term archaeology that gets used differently by different peoples, um, um, and so different fields, right? So my wife's got a degree, and one of her degrees is in is a lawyer, and so she talks about the landscape of a problem. Um, but, uh, you know, in sort of the, the art historical approach to, to landscape is this view from a single point, so like landscape painting, um, which would very much overlap with a view shed, right? I mean, it's sort of a, it may be right. a panoramic um, landscape painting, but, but I, um, but still a view from a single location. Um, and that's definitely a way that landscape can be conceived of and, and used. Um, I sometimes think about it as slightly broader in terms of, you know, it's what you can see from a certain place, but also what you can see in your mind's eye from that place. And so you're going to be tying, you know, your, your route or your, your view of the, the area around you to that, um, what you can see, but also what you know is over the hill or over the horizon. Um, 
and, and then it gets fuzzier from there. And so, yeah, I, mean, I think it depends on how you how you want to use and define the term landscape. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Ben, so um, my question is, I know that you come from a CRM background, as I do as well, uh, getting my career, and I'm sure since adopting an approach like this, it causes you to sort of rethink your past labors. Um, strictly speaking of an archae- of archaeological survey, how do you think um, an MCL approach might change strategies for, for archaeological survey specifically? Um, I, I- I think the only major change I would I would want to see or ask for or hope for maybe hope for um, would be more integration between what we see on land and what we see underwater. Um, when you go to these conferences, a lot of, you know, and for like, archaeology is guilty of this, where they have you know they, they make you click a box for terrestrial or underwater program, right? Um, sort of denying that there is there's overlap. That, between the two of them. And so, uh, you know, I would like to see more crosstalk uh, between those who do submerged prehistoric, those who do submerged, um, you know, sort of more, more shipwreck-oriented, um, and those who work on, on land, um, because that, to me, is what sort of begins to create the landscape. Um, and so that's the only thing I would really say. Is our, I mean, I think our technologies and our methods for identifying things are, are strong. Um, and, you know, in the last, and maybe five, ten years ago, I would have said we needed more ethnography and more consultation. Um, but I think we are, well, we probably still need more of that. But, um, but we're getting better at that, too, um, as, a, as, a, as a field. And so um, I think, you know, our basic methods are good. I think it's just getting out of our silos, which is what I would argue for. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think one comment um, I have, and you can respond, is that in, in terrestrial archaeology, there is a, a long history of landscape approaches, uh, particularly in historic archaeology, that being planned landscapes or ideological landscapes or rural landscapes, etc. But um, And in that way, the way that landscape is approached in terrestrial archaeology is quite various, quite heterogeneous, such that they can't always speak to each other. Um, but what's kind of uh, novels that, in terms of maritime landscapes, we have a, one very, I, I can see a very cohesive um, approach, and maybe that's because the source is often from Westerdahl and, and his approach. So, um, but I think it's kind of interesting to think to think then about how um, that sort of cohesive, um, well considered approach to landscape could be a, could be then applied to to landscape terrestrial landscapes as well. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's, there's a there's, there's an argument for not being on the on the cutting edge of things. Um, in that, yeah, that I agree that, that you know on on land landscapes have shifted quite a bit from you know that the original use of the term, which was largely looking at gardens um, mm-hmm. and, and sort of like people's you know behind their homes or next to their homes, um, and then expanded out pretty pretty rapidly from there. And by the time uh, maritime folks got a hold of it, you know, they, they picked it up at a certain place, and it, it already, the, the, a lot of the hard thinking had already been done by, by terrestrial folks, and, um, and I think it would be a mistake for, for maritime cultural landscape folks to ignore that, because it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a great literature to pull from. Um, and I don't, I, mean, I guess I don't, I don't necessarily see heterogeneity as a bad thing. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think the inability to communicate with each other is, is not good, but you know, the, the more ways we can, the more we can communicate, the more different ways of looking at something, the more different lines of evidence I see as a, as strengthening it. Um, mm-hmm. And again, sort of going back to that, that the analogy of if, you know, if we can all agree that the landscape, this particular landscape, is important, it, it doesn't really matter that we all agree that why it's important. If we can work together to preserve it, or work together to respect it, um, and respect each other, then. I, I think we all can win in that respect, and so I'm not sure if I'm responding to the question or not. But. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I, the the approach that you've set out here um, really makes a good case for um, integrity of different sorts of elements, and that isn't always possible in terrestrial landscape. And I think one of the issues with um, with the the various approaches in terrestrial landscape is that if we think about management. 
um, and, and things like guidelines for the National Register, it's made it difficult to, um, to talk about things like significance and integrity um, because are we talking about formal landscapes, garden landscapes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's kind of profound to see um, the, the MCL folks sort of setting out a, a, a cohesive um, set of, of guidelines that can integrate uh, or, or be inclusive to user language of a lot of different approaches, so. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not sure everyone would agree with me on this, but I would, I would sort of argue that landscapes, I mean, there's the, there is sort of a, a single definition of what integrity means, um, and they break it out into sort of the seven aspects of integrity. Um, but, but, and those, those can be applied broadly, um, but we do sort of have slightly different rules for archaeological sites versus standing structures, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, but um, I, I would sort of argue that all landscapes are archaeological in that they have developed over time and have um, been subjected to, to site formation processes, both you know cultural and natural. And so I think of them in, sort of as, archae- as archaeological. And of course, mm. being an archaeologist, I think that there's probably some bias there. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of thinking about all the pieces of a landscape and how they fit together and thinking about integrity, I would argue that one way to approach that is to think about integrity from the archaeological sense of integrity. Um, but I don't know if everyone would, would concur. Mm-hmm. Anyone want to chime in out there? <laughs> Uh, one quick question, Ben. Um, do you see any emerging issues in the archaeology of maritime cultural landscapes? Um, I'm I'm sure it's it's a hot topic at uh, conferences. For example, the the underwater archaeology conference in New Orleans. Are there any trends in research that you see that may point towards uh, future directions, um, or even ways that you might now be rethinking um, your own dissertation work? Um, I try not to think about it. <laughs> yeah. But um, actually, I mean. I, you, you mentioned uh, the, the national um, the, just blanked on it, sorry the um, National Register um, mm-hmm. Symposium that was in 20, 2015 uh, and I I would say that that is pro- in, in one place to look at sort of the direction that people are pushing this and, and sort of the exciting direction that people are taking it um, both from sort of a, a pure research perspective as well as from sort of a, a management and, and heritage perspective um, I think that's you know, I would point to that as where a lot of the, you know, um, you know, people were sort of taking it in, in myriad of different directions. And, um, uh, and so, I, you know, in terms of uh, involving, um, you know, seeing, seeing TIPOs like the Narragansett get involved, um, you know, I think there's a lot of places that it's, it, could, it could go. Um, I would be, I don't, I'd be hesitant to try and say which one direction is, is going to head. But I, I would point to that as a, if people are interested in seeing kind of a, a broader perspective, that would be the place to look right now. Mm-hmm. Great, great. And as I mentioned, um, Barbara White at the National Register is working um, along with collaborators to uh, publish the proceedings from that, which should be exciting. And um, and in the future, there will be a, a, a bulletin on, um, hopefully on maritime cultural landscapes issued by the National Register. So. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. This is Hans. And I, I'd also mention that um, the National Marine Protected Areas Center has a cultural heritage online toolkit. And if, if you don't know, the, the MPA folks a while ago kind of broke up marine protected areas into three categories, kind, kind of that division we, you mentioned earlier, natural resources, cultural heritage, and then kind of sustainable uh, activities, fishing. Uh, but obviously there, there's a lot of overlap. The Cultural Heritage Toolkit Online has is, is landscape heavy, cultural landscape analysis heavy, and benefits from the uh, you know the symposium we talked about in 2015 and, and other meetings that have been held, and it's really an idea that's moving forward. So I appreciate the presentation today, Ben. Mm. And I'm really I'm I, I find it incredibly gratifying that that um, and, and just exciting that you know that, that NOAA and other groups are, are really kind of running with this because it's um yeah i think it's i think it's great that people are interested and, and want to try and use some of these ideas 
Yeah, I'm working on this morning the S3 Story Map Journal for a kind of a, <laughs> an in-reach teaching tool for our own agency in maritime cultural landscapes and forest sanctuaries, as a matter of fact. Very cool. Great, so I got some, some chats. Um, please announce that the symposium proceedings will be on the NPS and BOEM website soon. The 2015 conference report has finally been published and is available online. And then I got a link. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see this. The proceedings from the 2015 uh, Wisconsin conference were just released. So I'll actually put the link in the uh, main chat and I can resend this out um, for my next webinar announcement. So it's, this is great to see. Um, out of these conferences and talks, um, a lot of uh, um, great, important literature that is going to set the foundation for uh, um, future research and uh, um, uh, heritage and preservation, of course. Great. Any other questions or comments out there? Well, thanks, Ben. That was a great, a great talk. Um, I'm gonna uh, we'll record it and post it on the National Park Service website. Uh, thank you, folks, for per that participated and listened in. Um, our next talk will be on April 19th at 3 p.m. It'll be on Paleocoastal Landscapes by uh, Torben Rick at the Smithsonian. Um, anybody who's interested, uh, who joined this time, that wants to be on the list, uh, please email me. Um, and with that, thanks so much, Ben, for joining us. Um, I will send out uh, Ben's bibliography, and I'm sure he's uh, welcome to receiving questions, <laughs> if you sure. have any, on this presentation. So. And thank you all for, for bearing with me. I really I, I, I love talking about this stuff, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thanks.